Sorry about the delay, guys. Finally, uh, there was there seems to be some operational issues, and it's ironical that we have an operational issue when we want to talk about operational stability of OpenStack. Cool. So uh, we're going to switch the session around a little bit. So uh, I'm Santosh. I'm a product manager for OpenStack at VMware, and uh, we have one of our customers, HeadServe, joining us on stage to share their experiences on. Uh, uh, using OpenStack to run their uh, using VIO VMware integrated OpenStack to run their OpenStack deployment. I'll let them introduce themselves and uh, go over their experiences on why they chose uh, why they chose OpenStack, what the business drivers were, uh, how they evaluated the different uh, deployment models, what uh, made them choose VIO as their uh, distribution of choice, and how it's been helping them uh, march towards their uh, business goals. And once they're done, I'll go through some uh, demos in VIO to show how we've, sim we've simplified some of the uh, operational uh, tasks around maintaining OpenStack and running OpenStack in a production deployment. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Isa Barisha. Uh, I'm the global director of the platform engineering team at HeadServe. Uh, TJ McTeer uh, is one of my senior engineers. So OpenStack. Uh, fun topic. Okay, just just a quick uh, uh, snapshot of who we are. HeadServe as an organization, we're in the fintech market. Um, when you think about maturity and change, uh, w this market's been notorious for being slow in adoption of technology and platforms. Size, we're about a thousand employees today. Um, how we get paid is something called assets under administration. We're a little over 300 billion right now. We've been uh, one of the number one, we have been the number one overall provider in the hedge fund administration industry for over three years in a row as a five or six year old startup. Um, a little bit about my team, uh, the platform that we manage uh, today, the size of it. Uh, uh, we hope to completely be on OpenStack by the end of the year. That's a, a big one for us today. Uh, and. You know, the interesting part about uh, our industry is we deal with a lot of uh, pets, right? And a lot of our pets are VMs uh, that were roughly on average around 90 gig in memory. That's the average VM that we deal with and, you know, 8 to 12 CPU. So we're a little bit in a abnormal in that aspect. Um, so why OpenSAC? It was simple. The old, uh, you know, I need more. I need faster uh, requests came down the line from uh, our executive team. Uh, the good thing about this initiative last year is that we did get executive sponsorship. It's, that's a huge key piece to uh, taking on a new platform, taking on unknown uh, charter territories. Um, so how do we go about it? Well, early on, we, we took some considerations. We can run OpenStack. We could go out and get a private cloud. We can uh, go out and get a managed service. Uh, you know, a lot of options. So uh, we had to go through a lot of uh, evaluations fairly quickly as we had a uh, tight deadline. Decision points, small team of engineers. Um, on the team, we actually had specifically two people focused on this. Myself and uh, TJ were predominantly focused on how do we get this online as soon as possible. The company was hiring a lot of dev. Agile uh, became a big piece, was a big piece, but really continuous integration, being able to knock down and turn up, uh, you know, a thousand VMs, changing the, the complete way we did dev cycles and QA cycles in the organization. So culturally, we were changing at the same time, and that required every piece of, of uh, our infrastructure to change. Donna from early today in the keynote, um, I like the terms she used, so obviously, as you guys can see, um, this. Uh, presentation was, you know, well made early this afternoon, after, but I like the way she said uh, systems of records. Uh, systems of records are these, sometimes we call them pets, sometimes we call them legacy apps. Uh, you know, the real reality is these are the apps that run the business today. These are the apps that make the money today. And, uh, you know, systems of innovation, I view it, these are kind of my own terms, I view it as web scale apps, they are cloud friendly, and they're what's going to help us make money tomorrow. They're going to help us continue to uh, bring in that income. So, why VIO? Uh, third time's the charm. 
So uh, I think, uh, you know, some person said, you have to fail a few times before you succeed. Um, and we, we did very well at that. So our first attempt, we went about it. We basically said, okay, we've got to do something um, with a small team. We haven't had the opportunity to ramp up from a skill set. So let's go the professional services route, right? Let's get SMEs to come in and help us implement this. Lack of adequate support, you know, implementation practices that were, that were poor, and a lack of security focus, as you can imagine. $300 billion of other companies' money and other investors. There's a lot of sensitive data, and the way you integrate into uh, a client, a vendor integrates with a client, how to make that possible, uh, there was a little bit of challenge. It also, it also showed the immaturity of a lot of OpenStack uh, implementations out there and their method of, about going into uh, making this possible. Uh, and obviously, it took three or four times longer than you know what was sold to us. Attempt number two: uh, manage service options. Um, you know, you guys know many of these. In 2015, uh, the market was just saturated of OpenStack providers. Um, some that can do managed services on their platform, on their hardware. Some that can manage your hardware internally, but. There were so many options, and you know, a lot of the considerations that we're looking, a lot of the vendors that we're looking, um, every other month, one of them was either going out of business, or one of them, or they were getting acquired. So it made uh, longevity and uh, stability concerns uh, become a huge key part. And after, during those considerations, we we tried attempt number three. We call these dark projects. So um, all of us. In this room, I think all of you guys probably do dark projects. I call them dark projects, but this is, basically, this is an initiative that your boss doesn't know about. This is something you try, you know, while no one's looking, and say, okay, is this, you know, what's the viability of something like this? Um, at the time, um, you know, of a little bit of research, we, you know, came across VIO had just come out of beta and gone to GA. I'm like, you know, quite frankly, what does VMware have in this in this uh, space? You know, they're you know, they're pushing their vSphere, their cloud suite. Um, Santosh is here, but you know, uh, this is what we're looking at. It's like, how devoted are they really? Should we even bother considering them? They're not, you know, when you go to look at OpenStack, they're nowhere in the top 10. Um, and crazy enough, we, we said, you know what, let's just try it. Let's just try it. We didn't bother talking to our EMC, uh, to our VMware wraps or anything of that sort. Downloaded it, deployed it, and something crazy happened. It just worked, you know. It actually just worked. So, if who's tried to do their own OpenStack deployments here, uh, if you've tried it, you can understand how that feels. You know, after you get a console up, it looks great. After you actually try to do something, that's a whole different story. And for us, this was we were just taken back by this. Um, and again, um, so being the director of the platform engineering team, I, we had to provide a platform, limited resources. How do I not lose my job, right? And how do I actually get the platform out to the end users? So we tried this, things worked, we took it to the next level. So I want to bring up uh, TJ um, to talk a little bit more specific around our OpenStack distribution or deployment, I should say. So we're using OpenStack a little bit differently than I want to say most of the people that you see out there today. Uh, our primarily VM, on average, runs about six and a half CPUs with 64 gigs of RAM. Our largest instances run over 110 gigs and 24 cores. Our smallest instances are, you know, 16 gigs of RAM, you know, four CPUs. We call those the little guys. When we were designing the stack, we needed to meet a requirement of we need to run 2,000 instances concurrently. We expect those instances will be recycled daily, and we need to house pets and cattle both of that in this, because OpenStack is our determined platform of the future. When you talk about running pets in OpenStack, you have to really be concerned about stability and high availability, right? Because obviously it's not its wheelhouse. So what we really liked about VIO and what is really leveraged here, ESX implementation, our reliance on clusters, lets us make huge compute nodes, you know, over 10 terabytes of RAM, hundreds of cores, uh, our storage ar architecture relies on uh, flash arrays and VIAA uh, initiatives. We get rid of a lot of those copy and write images and move to full clones. 
it really helps us when it comes to some of those pet managements because you don't have to be as worried about large numbers of instances disappearing. Uh, we're a huge DevOps shop. VIO, if you really don't know, is essentially just an Ansible-based deployment of OpenStack. It allows for great configuration management when you need to start changing your DHCP INI because you're using Windows DNS and you want to register your guests in that. It's as simple as updating a custom YAML, redeploying, right? The really way you should be doing it. Uh, you also upgraded it, right? We ran an upgraded VIO from 1.0 to 2.0 without talking to Santosh, right? Later on, we opened a ticket and they were surprised. Apparently, that's a big deal in the OpenStack world, but it just, again, worked the blue-green nature of the upgrade path. Really makes that very easy. And if we talk about some of the other things that it does, they package in, if you're essentially an EA customer, you're gonna have Log Insight likely as well. You have in-grind syslogging, very manageable. Can't tell you enough how useful that has been in troubleshooting the problems that you know, inevitably arise. So how did we measure our success? It's fast. We can deploy about 100 data, uh, terabytes worth of data generation in under 30 minutes. The vast majority of that time and system turn up is Windows SysPrep. The instances launch in minutes. And again, that's a lot of the integration between VMware and the all-flash array we chose. But right, without that, you're gonna be relocked into a lot of these copy and write images in order to get that speed. HA works without intervention. We've had host failures. We've done rolling upgrades of our VMware hosts from 6.0 to 6.0 update one while running live production workloads without any downtime to our guests. We've recovered from a critical failure where uh, an error basically caused vSphere and our database, one of our three database nodes running OpenStack to be destroyed. We went from in a dangerous state to back up in under four hours all user VMs and instances remained running throughout the entirety of the time. vSphere allowed us to do this essentially with their uh, CLI that they've implemented, basically it just regenerated the Maria database from a new VM, spun it back up. Again, no real problems at all. And again, in-place live upgrades is really kind of a thing you don't see very much. Just a, a few final thoughts on how we're using OpenStack. We've had 100% uptime since we deployed it. We're running it with thousands of VMs on a 24 by seven uh, cycle and only two people call, right? So if something breaks, everybody's gonna call one of two people. We don't get calls. Our users love it. So we have some more information here uh, from Santosh. Just gotta bear with me while I change the slide decks too though. Thank you so much, uh, Isa and uh, TJ, for sharing your experiences. And uh, for me, the, the best part was when we found out that you'd upgraded OpenStack from ISOs to Kilo without any professional services, without anyone from our engineering involved. That was sort of the highlight of uh, working on this product for me. And with that, since we are a little time crunched, I'm just going to jump into uh, some of a few demo videos that show how uh, VIO, uh, VMware Integrated OpenStack, makes it really simple and easy to operate OpenStack in a production environment. And since TJ mentioned about how easy it was for him to upgrade OpenStack, I'm just going to go through the upgrade workflow and show how simple it is to upgrade OpenStack from one release to another using VIO. Okay. 
let me give you a little bit of background on how we do upgrades. So we follow a procedure called blue-green upgrades, where basically what we do is when you want to upgrade from an older version of OpenStack to a newer version of OpenStack, we stand up a completely new control plane of OpenStack based on the new uh, release of OpenStack. Say, for example, when we went, went from 1.0 of uh, VIO to 2.0, we jumped from ISO-based release to a Kilo-based release. So when you upgrade from 1.0 to 2.0, what we do is we uh, create a completely new control plane that's based off of the Kilo code base. And once the, that control plane is up and running, we migrate all the database and the configuration from your older cloud, the ISO-based cloud, over to the newer uh, Kilo-based control plane that we just created. Once that happens, we switch your uh, public IP, the, the IP uh, or the domain name that you associated with the OpenStack, the domain name that your end users are going to use to access the OpenStack services. So we switch that over to the new uh, control plane, and then we decommission the old control plane. So this makes it really simple to uh, uh, upgrade from one release of OpenStack to another release of OpenStack. And the added benefit you get is it makes it roll back even more easier. Say, for some reason, if you figure out that the newer control plane is not for you, the newer distribution is not as stable uh, as you expected it to be, you can always revert back to your older control plane because uh, they're just sitting there. And you could uh, move your uh, public IP address back to your old control plane, and you could start using your older control plane. So the blue-green upgrade, uh, we chose to go with that procedure because it made upgrade a lot more stabler than in-place upgrades. And it gave us the added benefit of uh, doing a rollback if something uh, failed during upgrade. So here, this is the standard uh, Horizon interface. And this is an OpenStack deployment that's running off of the older code base, uh, ISO's based code base. And here we see a bunch of uh, virtual machines that have been created. Let me jump back a little bit. Come on, play down. So th these virtual machines were created in the older version of uh, OpenStack, ISO's based OpenStack. So we log into the vSphere, uh, vSphere web client, which has a, a plugin for OpenStack, plugin for VMware integrated OpenStack. So this plugin is basically uh, sort of the heart of the entire uh, OpenStack control plane. So all configuration changes that you want to make to your uh, VIO control plane, uh, all maintenance operations, uh, are done through workflows that are provided by this plugin in your uh, vSphere web client. So we go to the vSphere web client, and we look at the version of OpenStack that uh, this uh, plugin is currently deployed and running in your data center. So we, uh, it's it's the ISO's release of OpenStack. 2014.1.4 is the uh, uh, long code for the ISO's release of OpenStack. And next, we look at how we upgrade from the ISO's release to a Kilo-based release. So what happens is the, the way we do upgrade is we provide a patch, a Debian patch, that includes all the uh, latest code for OpenStack. You download the Debian patch and copy that over to your uh, management server, which uh, management server is sort of like the configuration server for your OpenStack deployment. It maintains all the configurations uh, and the topology information for how you've deployed OpenStack on your uh, uh, hardware. So you download a Debian patch, which includes all the code for the newer release of OpenStack, and you install that patch using a patch utility that we ship with our product. And by the way, for uh, minor patches, minor patches that are typically small bug fixes, uh, uh, fixes that take care of security issues, we uh, ship patches. And this is the exact same procedure that you would follow to patch your OpenStack release. So once you've patched your management server, you log out of vCenter and log back in. And once you go to your uh, OpenStack plugin, you notice that the management server has now been upgraded to the latest release of OpenStack, 2015 1.1, which is the Kilo release. So what this uh, says is that your management server, all the packages, OpenStack packages on your management server has now been upgraded to the Kilo version. And now we have to go push these management, uh, push these uh, new packages onto a new control plane. So your deployment, your OpenStack control plane, gets upgraded to the latest release. So 
you go to the management tab uh, in the in the plugin and there is an option to now upgrade to a new release so you just uh, pick that option to upgrade to a new release and you present it with a, a simple visit that accepts a, a few inputs and then just goes forward and upgrades your openstack you enter a deployment name for the new control plane that's being uh, created alongside your uh, existing older control plane and once you do that you specify a, a temporary public ip for testing and verifying that the new control plane works fine so, so what happens here is uh, the ip that you specify here this is going to be assigned to the newer control plane that we stand up so once we stand up the new control plane and alongside your older control plane you can spend some time to sort of test that everything is fine with the new control plane uh, look at all the data you've created make sure that all your data has been migrated over the over to the new control plane all the while through a temporary ip uh, and your uh, the, the real openstack endpoint that your developers were using that that will be still associated with the older control plane and once you make up your mind once you decide that okay i want to switch completely to the new control plane at that point will throw away this temporary ip and associate your existing openstack endpoint ip address to the new deployment so you specify a public a temporary public virtual ip and a private virtual ip and that's about it and you say upgrade so now what's happening is the management server is deploying a completely new control plane that's based on the new release of openstack kilo release of openstack and once that's done uh, the new control plane goes into a prepared state which means all the services have been deployed now you need to migrate the data at this point you go to your old control plane and you say i want to migrate my database and my configurations over to the new control plane and while the migration is happening uh, the management server is sort of going to turn off the old control plane stop all the services so that we don't create we don't accept new api calls and create new objects in openstack while data is being migrated so we want to freeze the state of the data before we migrate it so we pause the old control plane once that's done once all the data is migrated we can uh, here we can look at the temporary public ip that's assigned to the new control plane in this example it's 10115961010 so if we navigate or uh, if we point our browsers to that ip address we are going to look we are basically going to look at our existing openstack deployment now available on the new openstack release so here we can go ahead and make sure that all our instances that we created before the upgrade are still there make sure that say your volumes are still there all the network topology is properly been migrated over to the new control plane and once you verified everything is good i, I want to keep this uh, new control plane you can go back to your uh, openstack plugin in v center and say switch over to the new control plane all, all is fine i want to start consuming my new control plane so at this point the ip address that was associated with your old control plane the ip address that your developers were using to access uh, openstack that has been uh, associated with the new control plane your kilo based control plane uh, in this case and after that you can just your developers once this is done your developers can keep accessing the same api openstack api endpoint or the horizon endpoint at the same ip address and they'll get all the functionalities of the new control plane because now the deployment has been upgraded to uh, the new release of openstack so we log back in through the horizon dashboard and we see that all the instances that we created before upgrade are still there uh, available on the same uh, public ip that i was using before the upgrade as a developer and just to make sure everything works let's associate a floating ip address with a instance that was created before the upgrade and once that's done we'll try to log into that virtual machine and make sure that we're still able to access the virtual machine and everything is running fine there you go so we've taken uh, the, the the 
huge complexity of upgrading out and made it really, really simple to uh, upgrade op uh, OpenStack from one major release to another. Uh, this is just one example of how we've simplified operations around uh, OpenStack and making it easy to maintain OpenStack in a production and uh, deployment. We also have, there are a lot of other workflows we've added to make make it uh, really easy to operate OpenStack. Things like backup and recovery where you could backup your OpenStack control plane. And at some point, like uh, TJ mentioned, if one of your hosts goes down taking your entire management cluster down, you can recover back from your uh, uh, backups really easily in a few uh, CLIs. So. That's pretty much all I have, and I think we're almost at the end of the session. I'll open it up for a few questions if you have any. Sure. Uh, so when uh, there is this transition state and uh, the old uh, version is stopped, does it mean that you just cannot do any changes to the OpenStack and the services uh, running on the VMs are still functioning? Is it correct? Or there is a downtime for... for when you're migrating the data from your older control plane to the new control plane, there is a downtime in the sense that uh, you won't be able to create any new workloads in OpenStack, but all your existing workloads, they will still be running. So existing workloads are uh, workloads that are already deployed, they'll keep running, they, they won't be disrupted at all. It's just that for the migration duration, uh, the developers won't be able to create new workloads. Okay, thank you for a lot of the talk. Um, I have a lot of VMware customers, and I believe I have two. I have a lot of questions, but I'll just ask two of them. Um, when we talk about VMware workloads, I believe we have two options, and one is the one you, you just explained about the OpenStack, and the other option is the full stack VMware, meaning like we using the vCloud directors, NSX, vSANS. Um, I want to ask why that. OpenStack was better than the full stack VMware um, cloud cloud environment. And that's the first question. And the second question is, when I talk about VIO, a lot of customers are getting um, bothered by the fact that it has a very large hardware requirement. I believe it was 60 cores and 200 gigabytes of RAM. Did it bother your environment? Okay. Um, so I guess we can go down the list, right? Um, one is a couple of decisions. One, we were, we were looking for OpenStack, right? So when you talk about vSAN versus um, one, of the, one of the things we, we did is we actually moved to Sol open, uh, SolidFire as uh, the storage backend. Um, one of the reasons is we haven't jumped on the bandwagon yet for hyperconverged, right? In our, at our point, we felt uh, compelling that the, a lot of the pieces, now again, this is, I, I want to be fair because this is a VMware uh, presentation, but i just talk about the bits and pieces. Now, OpenStack w um, actually further enables you that once you get OpenStack online and running, you can use uh, vSAN later. You can use NSX later and transition into that because they do support the drivers for all those pieces. So the, 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 real, the real question is, okay, what goes first, right? Um, well, for us, OpenStack was the most difficult thing in the market in early 2015. Um, again, we tried a bunch of implementations and they failed. Um, so uh, storage was stable, right? For most, for most of us, storage is stable and you have options, right? When it came to OpenStack, it, there's OpenStack and really just who are you going to partner with? Um, we were not large enough to say we're gonna, you know, go straight from source and, and build it ourselves. So uh, that's one piece. Number two is, you know, just the ecosystem, right? Uh, when, you know, again, talking about uh, vCloud Direct and everything, um, we're a multi-cloud platform, um, so we do certain things in AWS, we do certain things in our private cloud. What the biggest driver was, how do I continue to make this company move forward, right? So we have 90% of the workloads that were the stuff that existed the last two years, last three years. How do I get to a, uh, 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 one platform for everything, right? Because you go out and you build OpenStack, the first question a lot of people ask you is, what are you going to use this for? And originally, I didn't understand why a lot of these vendors were asking me because um, later on, I understood there was a lot of instability, there was a lot of immaturity in the OpenStack and op some of the pieces, you know, Cinder. Um, and even if you get the maturity of, of OpenStack, the drivers, uh, the quality of the drivers vary exponentially. So um, that bit us, right? So when we went to uh, VIO, 
again, you know, we, at the time, we didn't expect, like, you know, everyone was viewing OpenSAC as a competitor to VMware and vSphere, but then when we realized it's actually made perfect sense, you know, for example, if we wanted to um, create a layer where we didn't necessarily care about the proprietariness on the, underneath, but when we realized, I mean, we, we loved vSphere, right? Everyone grew up with saying, hey, this is kind of st a stability platform. It's been matured. We still have to continue to run these systems that are big and not scale friendly or uh, cloud friendly, but then we also wanted to prepare for the future. So how do we not have silos of platforms. Um, so um, when everything just worked, we we're just so taken back and, and we you know, kind of progressively made that. And number two is, you know, I don't know if I had a, a point on my slide, but when we we're going to, uh, you know, it's all about value, right? You, I, uh, one of the presentations today that said it best, you know, they're like um, op uh, open source is, uh, as, is free as long as your, your time is worthless, right? Uh, kind of. So you're going to pay at some point one way or another, right? So when we looked at the, the cost and value proposition, um, if you're already invested, uh, which we had a platform on, on vSphere, the additional, uh, is one, it's free, right? If you want to go on your own, and, and we did. We did. We went for almost a year on our own before we said to the VMware, hey, um, all right, well, we're fine paying the support. And the support cost was like incremental to nothing. So um, it was a, it really, we almost couldn't believe it. And, and to be quite honest, uh, I have a managing director that said, I want to move to open source and I don't want to invest more in VMware, you know, openly, right? But we developed a story that almost he couldn't say no. And he, you know, he really wanted to, and he said, this made absolute sense. You know, we can get everything we want. We can continue to focus on the more important things, which really, quite frankly, is everything above the platform, right? You need the platform to continue to run, which is a big piece, right? You, you want it to stay online, or else you're going to be spending a lot of uh, weekends and weeknights um, very unhappy. Thank you. No problem. So I don't know if th did that answer all your questions? Am I allowed to ask another question? You, I think so. I don't know that there's anyone in the, else in line. Go ahead. Sorry. Did you want to add anything, <laughs> Santosh? Um, well, ma maybe I can talk to you later. But Go ahead. Mamar, sure. um, did you have any pro problems with the Cinder VM DK driver? Because um, I had a customer. I had a lot of problems with. Um, I use I'm an IBM proprietary driver, and I had a lot of problems about that. But it, did you have any problems with Cinder? <laughs> The short answer to your question is no. Oh, okay. um, the longer answer to your question is we had a lot of problems with Cinder drivers, <laughs> uh, especially those made by three-letter companies that own VMware. Okay. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if we go further than that, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, Cinder specifically, when it comes to ESX implementations, yeah. implements uh, Cinder volumes as a VM, which shows up running in your stack. You can run into issues with storage DRS if you're doing some funky things there and locking. Um, and uh, I don't know specifically what issue you encountered, but if you want to take it offline, I'm sure you, we could give you some yeah. insight as to yeah. solve it. And back over towards your question um, about uptime and the upgrade, VMware separates the data plane and the control plane completely. You could wipe out your entire controller and all of your instances will stay running and up and 100% available. That's really the driving factor there. You had asked about the total consumption of the management, uh, the controllers, and to get VIO online. Um, it actually really isn't much. I mean, they give you the extreme because it, what they do is they basically uh, prepackage uh, implementation of VIO 1.0. It was up to 2,500 VMs. So we knew automatically, uh, let's call it day 90, because by the time we got the hardware, when we said this is a green light, we got the hardware, we implemented, we had changed everything, a platform, um, even vSphere. We're on five, going to six. Uh, storage vendors, um, communications, we went moved away from private channel to 10 gigabit iSCSI, um, storage platforms, um, and leveraging all those APIs. Um, so, so much change happened that um, when, when you look at the management piece, right, if you're building any sizable cloud, right, um, it, it really is negligible, right? Because at the end of the day, you can squeeze those. But they, what they're doing is they're giving you a pre-canned uh, package for up to 2,500 VMs. Now, necessarily, if you don't think you'll ever get to that, you can squeeze those VMs there. You know, you can power them out and squeeze them. We may not want to say that. <laughs> yeah, when we created the product, we sized it for a really large deployment. We have a customer who's running about 6,000, 7,000 VMs on a single deployment of uh, VIO on a single vCenter. We sized it for that kind of deployment. But then in practice, what we found is not everybody wants that kind of scale. So in our upcoming releases, we are bringing that uh, size down to pretty much half of uh, what the current production size is. 
and we're also looking at uh, putting everything in a single VM and making that production ready. So in our labs, in our tests, we found that uh, all services running on a single VM is good enough for a, a scale of about 2,000, 3,000 VMs and for a concurrency of about 20, 25 VM creations at a time. And there are a lot of use cases for which this is good enough. And we, we are sort of exploring, really shrinking the control plane down to a single VM and adding some HA and uh, vSphere-based HA and some backup uh, routines behind it. So it's production ready and it makes it really simple to deploy your OpenStack. If it's in a single VM, you can just power it down and everything comes up. Um, yeah, we have a lot of customers saying that they want to do proof of concept with VIO, but since that's a large hardware requirement, it's really hard to do that, so. Absolutely, so yeah. we've gotten that request from a lot of other customers too. Yeah, and so that's great news, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, in one of the upcoming releases, fairly soon you'll see much smaller sized VIO. Okay. So one of the other bad tricks you can do with that yeah. is you can deploy virtualized ESX servers with yeah. fake <laughs> size, deploy that, and then really, you know, um, you'll get to, because it requires a minimum of three ESX servers for the management cluster, yes, yes. Um, just for resiliency, obviously, right? Murano, three instances and so forth uh, for a couple of reasons, but uh, I've actually done it on top of virtualized ESX now, again. He's got to close his ears, but. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, but that's it. I mean, you know, there isn't, uh, aside from test, test stuff, um, you know, the, the one thing I can tell you that blew me away as well, and again, we had to reach out to uh, VMware and say, guys, uh, are you actually supporting this product? It, it seems to work, right? Because they weren't heavily pushing it that early on in 2015. Um, so we had to actually reach out to them. But the one thing that you can feel comfortable that, uh, I mean, uh, you know, if you can imagine what the pressure we felt at that time where we had so much uncertainty and we were kind of running out of time, um, is that we couldn't believe it just worked. So at least that you'll know that you'll go from zero to a, POC, a function in POC, um, you know, exponentially fast because you already you don't have to worry about 90% of the stuff underneath uh, uh, OpenStack if you're on the vSphere, uh, vSphere platform. Thank you. No, VIO is a full distribution of OpenStack. Uh, it comes with all the core OpenStack services. You can, it's a full distribution of OpenStack optimized to run on a vSphere hypervisor and uh, VMware products. Yes. So I, I'm a little bit confused. So if there's a controller node, mm -hmm. it has to run on the node itself. But then the worker node just has the hypervisor ESXi. So when you do the upgrades, w w what is happening? Is that ESXi impacted when you do a VIO upgrade? No. Right, your VMware separates the data plane and the control plane completely. So your running workloads that are running on ESX are not impacted. There's no Nova agent running on your compute nodes. There's an actual VM that's created that represents a cluster. That is your compute node, which runs the Nova agent. That goes down, but just like VMware, all of your VMs stay up. When you cut over to the other database, the new compute node is there. You're basically live. The support cost, or how that works? Or okay, the VIO one is it? Uh, how's that the license and support works actually? So, so VIO the product itself, it's free to download and use, and there is a support cost associated with it. The only support cost. Yeah. Okay, sure. So, so the question is, is VIO only for customers who already have a deployment of vSphere or uh, customers who want to get started from scratch, can they use it too? This can be used by customers who want to start from scratch too. They have to deploy uh, vSphere and ESX from scratch and then they can deploy VIO on top of it. Uh, this needs yes, this needs vCenter, uh, ESX, the whole vSphere uh, hypervisors. Yeah, stuff. it doesn't matter what, um, what OpenStack distro you go with that you need you need nodes, you need storage, 
and then you need to determine what your storage is going to be, right? The drivers, right? Because OpenStack is, they pretty much are, uh, I mean, it's Ubuntu, Ansible, you know, managed by VMware. So it's, it's very vanilla OpenStack, and that's, a, that's also a concern we had about, the o about OpenStack. So it's, a, it's pretty vanilla, but just like a lot of the distributors, they only support their vendor, some of the vendor specific drivers. So for, you know, for Nova and for compute, it's, you know, vSphere and the DV switches for uh, networking. Uh, Cinder, it's the VMDK. So uh, every vendor has the same kind of setup. Um, you know, if you're already on vSphere, you don't have to build a brand new vSphere platform greenfield. You can, we, we actually built it right on top of what we already had existing. Um, there's a little caveat on the management cluster, you know, just to make sure there's enough capacity there to deploy it. But aside from that, it's, it's straightforward. And everything, uh, you know, uh, Santosh was showing is kind of like the fuel similar thing, the management console to do all management integration, upgrades, op op operational tasks. So that's what you use, but you use that very rarely. You use that when you want to add compute um, and so forth. You know, the, the best thing about it I can say is it's been actually for about five months to uh, set it and forget it. I mean, we haven't touched OpenStack ever since we, we confirmed that everything was functioning. Um, I assume that's for um, ESXi is free, so only ESXi support cost, and then vCenter software plus support cost, and then VIO support cost, right? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. How, how about that another video you said um, about the package, right? Is it like 2500 VM? Is it how that works? Maybe you can answer. If you can you repeat that? The license one for the VIO. Is so it goes to like a 25 under like SRM, how they licensing? There is there is no licensing on that. It's just simply they've pr ver uh, version one, version two. I think is up to five thousand. Up to five thousand. Up to five thousand. It, it all it simply is one of the biggest problems of OpenStack is configuring and making it scalable. Um, so I, I you know we we actually enjoyed uh, the uh, VMware's approach where they basically you know one of the gentlemen was talking about the size of the management uh, uh, and the, the nodes and clusters the compute clusters uh, one of the nice things was that they pre canned it and it when it, when you deploy it it can support comfortably up to five thousand so you don't pay on instances you don't pay on instances you just simply pay on uh, every ESX server and you know if you're already paying if you already have ESX. Then you just, if you want support, it's 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 a very small fractional tick uh, up. Yeah. It's about so 600 bucks, so what is it? 200 bucks. 200 bucks 200. per socket. CPU, per CPU. Per Physical socket. CPU, yeah. yeah. So there's uh, no licensing cost. You could use VIO to run as many VMs as you want. There is, uh, and if you want support, it's on a per uh, physical CPU, per socket basis. All right, I think uh, that's about all the questions we have. Th thank you so much, folks, for making it to the session. Hope you have a good rest of the summer at Austin. <laughs>